the hidden teachings of Jesus. The reason Jesus spoke in parables is because he knew that if he spoke plainly about his teachings, that the powers that control the world would never allow his teachings to be disseminated. And so he created Trojan horses full of truth. And the powers that be embraced Jesus' teachings, not understanding that the meaning behind these parables would expose their lies and distortions. This video will open up these Trojan horses and let the truth expose those that have hijacked it and contorted Jesus' real teachings. After watching this video, as Jesus himself said, John 8:32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The world you live in is not real. You think that you were born into this world, but it is the exact opposite. The world is born in you. Every time you place your consciousness through the mind and the five senses, you create this world. There is a parallel world that coincides with this world that you can also experience instead of this one. After opening up a few energy centers in your body, you can experience this world whenever you want. Jesus called this world the kingdom of heaven. Jesus taught what would today be called Kundalini Yoga. Yoga is a science. It is not a religion. A religion is when you have faith or belief in another person's experience of the divine. Yoga is a systematic and scientific method of experiencing the divine. Jesus was not a Jew, nor did he preach a religion. He was a yogi. The people of his day called him rabbi because he taught about the divine and conceptually where they were coming from, only rabbis did. Jesus was killed because he upset the power structure of his day, saying that the traditional practice of worship was not an effective way to experience the divine. Jesus preached yoga, a methodical way to experience the divine. The body your consciousness is placed in comes with a mind, and the mind acts as a bottleneck in the ability of the consciousness to utilize the brain. The mind actually prevents you from fully accessing your capabilities. As long as you use the mind to perceive the world, you do not have the capability or the capacity to understand who and what you are or what you are capable of. You were born to sin. This is what Jesus said. And this is no fault of your own because your consciousness was placed in a malfunctioning body. The world you perceive with your five senses in mind doesn't even exist. It is a creation of the mind. Sinning is believing that you are the body and the worldly desires it creates has something to offer you. Your consciousness has only received information from the mind and the five senses your entire life. So you erroneously believe this is what you are. But if you were the mind, you could tell it to stop thinking and it would. When you go to a movie theater, you know that what you are seeing is not real. Yet you still go through a roller coaster of emotions as your endocrine system pumps out various hormones depending on what you see. And it is all fantasy. When the movie is over, you walk outside into the real world, and again, you go through a roller coaster of emotions as your endocrine system pumps out more hormones, depending on what your mind thinks and perceives from the real world. What is the difference? In the first example, the world you are experiencing is light being shown through still frame pictures flashing by. In the second example, the world you are experiencing doesn't even exist until you create it by placing the light of your consciousness through the filter of your mind and five senses. Your thoughts from the mind are so powerful that they press upon the unmanifested and create the world you are experiencing. When your consciousness transcends the mind and five senses and is shown through the Ajna Chakra or third eye, a completely different world is both created and experienced. As Jesus said in Matthew 6.22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus is clearly telling us that we are sinning when our consciousness is placed through the filter of the mind and the five senses with two eyes instead of our Ajna Chakra or third eye, thine eye or single. Why do religions teach us that sinning is acting on the desires of the mind? 
Jesus is saying that you can serve the body or you can serve the divine depending on where your consciousness is placed. When Jesus looked upon the ocean through his opened Ashna chakra, he saw vibrating energy. And since he himself was vibrating energy, he could walk upon it. When we look at the ocean, we see water. And so the physical world our thoughts create would drown us if we attempted Jesus's feet with our unopened third eye. The goal of this documentary is to help you recognize your Christ consciousness or the second coming of Christ. Jesus is not coming back. He never left. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. If Jesus existed before his body, how could he die with his body? Just like you, Jesus is, was, and will always be timeless consciousness. The second coming of Christ is one of the most misinterpreted aspects of the Bible. The second coming of Christ refers to you recognizing and obtaining your Christ consciousness. How do you achieve this? You follow Jesus' teachings. Jesus was a yogi. When Jesus spoke the words, Matthew 11:29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus was referring to his yoga. The word yoke and yoga both mean joining. What is being joined? Your soul with your Christ consciousness, enabling you to tap into the universal consciousness. Your Anahata chakra with your Ashna chakra. Your heart with your intellect. How do you do this? You do what Jesus did. You study and practice the science of yoga. Ask a Catholic priest or a Christian minister what Jesus was doing from the ages of 13 to 30. Why is this period of time when Jesus went from an intellectually gifted young man to Jesus the Christ left out of the Bible? To a Christian, Jesus is the most important person to have ever lived, yet the majority of his life is completely left out of the Bible. How is this possible? How did Jesus become enlightened? And what exactly was Jesus doing when he was fasting out in the desert for 40 days? Jesus spent his adolescent years and young adulthood traveling through India, Nepal, and Tibet, studying, practicing, and teaching yoga. The three wise men from the East that visited him were rishis from India. There is no country called the East. Why do the Christian religions obfuscate these facts? Why don't they want you to know the true path to the divine? Jesus was given the option to disavow his teachings and return his life would be spared. He declined, saying, my body means nothing to me. My teachings are the sole purpose of why I am here. And yet today there are religions named after him that completely disregard his teachings. Revelation 1.12 states, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. And in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When Jesus revealed his true form to his disciple John, John saw Jesus' seven chakras. Jesus himself said in Revelations 1.20, the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. What do you do at a church? You worship. Jesus called them candlesticks. The yogis call them chakras. They are the same thing. Jesus was a kundalini yoga master. The seven seals, seven lamps, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven churches in the Bible are referring to what yogis call the seven chakras. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The water birth Jesus is talking about obviously refers to when you are born to your mother. The spiritual birth that Jesus talks about is what the yogis refer to as your kundalini. 
You do not become spirit until you have turned on your kundalini, opened up all of your chakras, and raised your kundalini to your crown chakra. Jesus is speaking about the electrical system inside our bodies that make our respiratory system, circulatory system, and digestive system redundant. They are not needed after you have your spiritual birth. You are destined to transmigrate or reincarnate until you have this spiritual birth. From the Gospel of James, And I answered and said to him, Lord, do not mention to us the cross and the death, for they are far from you. The Lord answered and said, Truly I say to you, none will be saved unless they believe in my cross. But those who have believed in my cross, theirs is the kingdom of God. Therefore become seekers for death, just as the dead who seek for life. For that which they seek is revealed to them, and what is there to concern them? When you turn yourself towards death, it will make known to you election. In truth, I say to you, none of you who are afraid of death will be saved. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who have put themselves to death. Become better than I. Make yourselves like the son of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about what the yogis refer to as nirvakalpa samadhi, where the yogi dissolves his ego and has complete union with the divine. Me and my father are one. In this samadhi, the heart, breath, digestive system have all been shut down by the yogi in a deep state of meditative bliss. This is what Jesus was doing out in the desert for 40 days. The energy centers or chakras start at the base of the spine and go to the top of the head. The spine resembles a snake. And so just as Moses lifted up the serpent or kundalini in the wilderness, we must also. Jesus talks about transmigration or reincarnation right in the Bible. In 1 Kings 19, it says, then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. So Elijah went from there and found Eliza, son of Shaphat. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Eliza then ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Elijah, John the Baptist, was Elijah's, Jesus's, guru in his former incarnation. In Matthew 17, 5, it is written, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the son of man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, if you are the prophet, why then did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already came, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Don't think for one moment that what Jesus attained is not attainable by you. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 14, 11, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. One mistake of the Christian religions is they deify Jesus and put him on a pedestal, when the reality is his teachings are what should be put on a pedestal. They say that Jesus was the son of God and born to a virgin mother. How could we ever aspire to be like him? But Jesus was once just an ordinary man. What made Jesus so great was that he fully evolved his consciousness and became one of the greatest yogis the world has ever known. He was born perfect, not because he was the son of God. We are all sons and daughters of God. He was born perfect because of the spiritual work he did in a prior incarnation as Elijah. It is our destiny to become like Jesus. 
The kingdom of heaven resides equally in all people. The purpose of your incarnation on this earth and Jesus' teachings is to enable you to obtain your Christ consciousness. We have been fed a lie that when we die, we will go to heaven or hell, depending on how we lived our life. This is not what Jesus taught. In Luke 17, 20, it is written, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of heaven is here and it is now. But as long as you are living through body consciousness, you are in hell. When you activate your kundalini and open up your chakras, perceiving the world through your third eye, you are in heaven or communing with the divine. When man loses his way, the divine sends down a prophet to help people find the path once again. Jesus did not have to endure the false duality of the body once again. He had his spiritual birth as Eliza, just as John the Baptist had his as Elijah. Both of these great souls were once just like us, sinners believing that they were the body. So do you want to practice a religion and worship the divine, or do you want to practice yoga like Jesus taught and experience the divine? They teach us in school that we evolved from monkeys, and then they tell us that only stupid people that have no understanding about science believe we were created. Yet when you understand the science of yoga, or more importantly, when you practice the science, you realize that your mind, thoughts, and five senses are creating this false paradigm that you are experiencing. The reality is that you are one with the divine right here and right now. The vibrations from your thoughts cause your consciousness to be entrapped by the body. Who amongst you believes that you can get some water, mix in a few minerals, strike it with lightning, and give birth to a living organism with consciousness? The more you study science, the more evident it is that we are designed by an intelligent force. If you want to call that force Allah, Ra, God, Krishna, or any other name, it shouldn't be a matter of contention. The thought that somehow we miraculously came to be without a designer is like thinking you could send a tornado through a junkyard and somehow create a Boeing 747 that can think. In the beginning, there was God and God alone, and so everything is created out of the divine. The great Saint Yogananda stated that God consciousness equals human consciousness plus thought. Our thoughts cause our consciousness to vibrate at a different level than the divine creating body consciousness. This creates the duality or belief that we are separate from the divine. Be still and know that I am God. A good metaphor is God is like the ocean and you are ocean water floating within him. Only you are encapsulated in a bottle. And so although you are floating in and surrounded by the divine, there is a separation that exists. Your body is like the bottle and the metaphor. Identifying yourself as the body causes a feeling of separation, that what you desire, want, or need is outside of yourself. The reality is that everything you experience is nothing more than an electrical sensation picked up by the five senses and interpreted inside the body. You are always your own experience. With body consciousness, you are happy or sad depending on whether the mind likes the electrical sensations that are being sent to it. This is a foolish way to live, allowing the fickle mind to decide your emotions for you. The nature of the mind is it is a desire-creating factory. Endless desires are created, and you only achieve temporary reprieve when you satisfy a desire. Then the mind goes quiet for a short amount of time and you feel your true nature, which is love, peace, and bliss. Unfortunately for you, the mind makes you think that you feel these emotions because you satisfied one of its desires, when the reality is you finally feel your true nature that the mind blocks from you with its body consciousness and desires. When the mind starts up again, it attributes the brief moment of consciousness or bliss coming from an earthly experience and thus the desire to experience this feeling again is created. All desires are actually a perversion to experience your true self, the divine within you. And soon after you satisfy a desire and achieve temporary bliss, another desire or demand is created by the mind and thus the wild goose chase begins again. And we all know how this game ends because the body is a temporary shelter for the consciousness. Ultimately, Bodily identification ends for everybody, 
no matter how gifted their physical life may be, it ends in the degeneration that old age brings. Jesus called the mind Satan. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, and hell are all metaphors. They don't exist. There is no opposite to God. This is from Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Why do the Christian religions tell us that if we don't follow their nonsense, that when we die, we will go to hell and be tormented by Satan for eternity? Jesus taught that body consciousness is hell, and our mind, or more specifically, the emotional component of it, known as the ego, is the devil. The truth is that we live in hell, tormented by the devil, until we open up our chakras. The real role of the mind is to tell the consciousness what is happening to the body. When you rely on the mind to tell you what is happening outside the body, you receive incomplete and sometimes inaccurate information. It is the role of the Ashna Chakra, or third eye, to supply the consciousness information about what is going on outside the body. But because you were born to sin and placed in a malfunctioning body, your third eye is not open. You have only received information from your mind your entire life. And so the mind has tricked you into thinking that you are it, that these thoughts are yours, and the only way to happiness is to satiate the mind's bodily desires. This is the definition of sin. The word sin means missing the mark. Many religions exploit people's misunderstanding of this concept fleecing the people for their guilt about their actions and thoughts created from the mind's bodily desires. The great Saint Ramakrishna said that when I am in the body, I feel like a fish trapped in a bucket. When I am in meditation, I feel like somebody dumped the bucket into the great river Ganges. To have the experience of oneness with the divine, you must transcend the mind, or more to the point, make your body function properly by balancing your nadis open up your chakras and raise your kundalini. This will open your third eye and let you experience the world as it is, not through the maya created by the mind and the five senses. Let's get into what your kundalini chakras and nadis are. Your body is made up of seven main chakras or energy centers. It is easy to go up and down your body and feel these energy centers. The first chakra or root chakra is the Muladhara chakra located in the perineum in men and near the cervix for women. You can feel this chakra by squeezing or tightening your anus forcefully and holding for one second and then letting it go. Your second chakra is called the Svadhasthana and can be felt by tightening the muscle you use to stop the flow of urine. Your third chakra is called Manipura and can be felt by gently pulling in and pushing out the stomach. Your fourth chakra is called Anahata and can be felt by pushing out your chest and recalling a time in your life that you felt and experienced love. Your fifth chakra is called the Vishuddha and can be felt by rolling your tongue to the back of your mouth and putting your attention on your tongue. Your sixth chakra is called Ajna or your third eye and can be felt by concentrating on the point between your eyebrows. Your seventh chakra is called the Sahasrara and can be felt by focusing on the crown of your head. There are three main parts to yoga, the asanas or physical postures, pranayama or breathing exercises, and meditation. The main purpose of the asanas is to open up your chakras. They give you the added benefit of giving your body strength, flexibility, and endurance that will be needed later for long periods of meditation. The purpose of pranayama is to balance out your nadis or the electrical system of your body and turn on your kundalini. And finally, meditation is needed to raise your kundalini and to take you through the various stages of samadhi or absorption in the divine. Most people live their whole life completely ignorant of the electrical system in their body. Even medical doctors have no idea where the electricity comes from in the body. Ask a doctor where the electricity that beats your heart originates from and you will be given a blank stare. 
It comes from the Muladhara chakra, and that is why nobody lives without their spine completely intact. If fats and carbohydrates are what makes your muscles move, how is it possible to make a dead frog's leg move with a little electricity applied to it? Every living thing has prana flowing through it. Prana is the little sparks of electricity that you can see as small specks of light dancing in the air. The prana in a potato can light up a bulb if you attach two electrodes to it. Cook the potato and you will destroy the life force and this is no longer possible. This same life force is flowing through our bodies. Unfortunately for us, this force does not flow evenly throughout the body. We are all mentally imbalanced. Half of the time, the right part of the brain is receiving more power than the left and vice versa the other half of the time. This causes mental fluctuations or thought, which causes body identification and leads to the false duality. As I've quoted before, Yogananda wrote that God consciousness equals human consciousness plus thought. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Well, how is this possible with this constant mental imbalance? When Jesus said the only way to the Father is through me, he wasn't referring to believing in him. He was referring to the exercises that he was teaching. When Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon, he again is explaining that you cannot have body consciousness and God consciousness at the same time. As long as you are receiving sensory perceptions, you have mental thoughts. As long as you identify with the body, you have desires and thus thoughts. Where do these thoughts come from? What causes them? If they are truly you or yours, why can't you stop them? The human body is designed for the electricity to flow through the central nervous system, or in yoga parlance, the shishuma. But because we are born to sin and placed in a body that is not functioning properly, we have locks in our chakras that prevent this from happening. So instead of the electricity flowing up the central nervous system, or shishuma, it alternates going up the parasympathetic nervous system. In yoga parlance, this is known as the ida nadi, and the sympathetic nervous system, pingla nadi. This, again, powers the right and left parts of the brain at different levels. You can tell which nadi is dominant by closing one nostril with your finger and trying to breathe through the other nostril. Then close the opposite nostril and try to breathe through the other nostril. Normally, one nostril will be completely open and the other nostril will be somewhat closed. This picture clearly shows the flap of skin that cover the turbinate areas of the nostrils, directing which nadi most of the prana will flow. In his famous talk, known as Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke of a yoga technique that is used to balance the nadis and thus balance the pranic flow to the brain. This technique is known as Kachari Mudra. In Matthew 7.13, Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This is another widely misinterpreted quote from the Bible that Yogananda explains in his book, The Second Coming of Christ. Yogananda writes, Jesus addressed his close disciples in a veiled metaphor. The straight gate and narrow way refer to the gateway in the subtle astral center at the base of the spine, which opens into the astral spine's narrow, extremely fine pathway through which the life and consciousness ascend to the higher cerebral spinal centers of spiritual perception, the sole path to realization of God and union with him. The great Saint Ramakrishna said, when the divine goddess comes up, the tongue rolls back. Jesus and these great saints are talking about Kachari Mudra. This is Kachari Mudra. When your tongue is resting in your mouth, it is in the wide gate, but when you place it up your nasal pharynx, you go in through the straight gate and ultimately through the narrow passageway up to the tenth gate. Sexually, you are one half of a whole, but spiritually, you are complete. You have both a phallus, your tongue, and a yoni, your nasal pharynx. This is what Jesus referred to when he spoke about the bridal chamber from the Gospel of Philip. For the Father anointed the Son, and the Son anointed the apostles, and the apostles anoint us. He who has been anointed possess everything. He possesses the resurrection, the light, the cross, the Holy Spirit. The Father gave him this in the bridal chamber. He merely accepted the gift. 
The Father was in the Son, and the Son in the Father. This is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are separated will unite and will be filled. Everyone who will enter the bridal chamber will kindle the light. The purpose of a mudra is to redirect the energy flows in the body. The reason Kachari Mudra is known as the king of all mudras is because of the benefit it bestows. Number one, the ability to stop the breath or go breathless, which quiets the mind considerably. Number two, it completes the electric circuit. It attaches the spine to the brain. Number three, allows the sadaka to balance the nadis, which then makes the electricity of the body go up the shishuma or brahma nadi. Number four, allows the sadaka to rub a nerve center, which leads to dharana or one pointedness of mind. Number five, turns on your kundalini or opens up the knot at muladhara chakra. Number six, allows the sadaka to push on a nerve center, shutting off all sensory perception. Number seven, allows the sadaka to drink from the fountain of youth or King Arthur's holy grail. Absorption of the liquid the brain makes, which is also known as ayahuasca, amrit, or DMT with the tongue, separates the consciousness from the mind. This is the land of milk and honey. Now that is quite a list there, so let's talk about them one at a time. Number one, Kachari Mudra gives you the ability to stop the breath or go breathless, which quiets the mind considerably. The ability to go breathless or stop the breath. That is impossible, you say. Someone would die if they stopped breathing. Do you believe you are breathing when you are a baby in your mother's tummy? That is different, you say, because your mother was supplying you with oxygen. Would it surprise you to know that the air you breathe in is 21% oxygen and the air you breathe out is 17% oxygen? Plus you are breathing out oxygen in the form of CO2. If oxygen was so important, why are you breathing so much of it out? Have you ever noticed that when you swim underwater for a minute or so and then come up for breath, the first thing that you do is exhale. You don't inhale first, you exhale. Apparently the body is more concerned with getting the carbon out of the body than it is getting oxygen in. The great yogi Shivananda, who was also a medical doctor, taught that we inhale to get the prana or electricity from the outside air into our lungs so it can be distributed to the body. If you think about our breathing apparatus, you notice at the top of it we exhale and inhale from a Y, with the mouth and the nasal passage being the top of the Y and the lungs being the bottom. The vacuum, followed by pressure from the diaphragm contracting and then relaxing, causes the breath to be turbulent, mixing up the outgoing and incoming air. This turbulence creates an environment that is very inefficient in its flow to dispose the toxic air, carbon dioxide, and get what is needed into the body, prana and oxygen. This causes a lot of unnecessary work for the body. When the breath stops, Carbon dioxide forms a stream that peacefully slides out of the body. A straight spine with the chin slightly pulled in enables this stream to form much quicker. Just a cursory glance at a nasal diagram and you can see that the passageways are set up to separate the incoming from the outgoing air. This can easily be verified by a 10 second experiment. Pay attention to where the air is coming from when you exhale and where the air is going when you inhale. The exhales are coming from the upper chamber of the nose where the carbon dioxide accumulates and the inhales are going into the lower chambers of the nose. Of course, the divine designed us so that when the diaphragm stops contracting, the carbon dioxide forms a peaceful stream and exits the body on its own. When the tongue blocks off the outgoing air from entering the mouth, the air cannot stimulate the nerves at the roof of the mouth that send an electrical signal to the diaphragm to contract. Kachari Mudra ends the gift of breath that you were given at birth when the amniotic fluid was forced out of your lungs by the doctor who turned you over and patted you on the back. Number two, completes the electric circuit. Kachari Mudra attaches the spine to the brain. There is a gap between your spinal column and the brain. This gap is bridged by what is called the brainstem and can easily be seen in this picture. We have all heard that we utilize a small fraction of our brain. This concept is misunderstood by many people. 
you do use 100% of your brain. It's just that the mind only has the capacity or capability to use a small portion of it at one time. Whereas when you can transcend the mind, you can then utilize 100% of your brain at the same time. This has been demonstrated by scientific experiments monitoring yogis in deep meditation called samadhi. When you take into consideration that every one of our 100 billion neurons may be connected to 10,000 other neurons sending information through synoptic connections, it doesn't take much literacy in mathematics to understand that the capability of utilizing 100% of the brain is not a tenfold increase in comprehension over utilizing 10% of the brain, but an exponential one. This sounds all great and everything, but what exactly does transcending the mind mean? You must shut down everything that is powering it up. This includes all sensory perception, your breathing apparatus, circulatory system, and digestive system. Be still and know that I am God. Looking at the picture, you can clearly see that there is a gap in the spinal column that is bridged by the lower brain, sometimes known as the reptilian brain, that is only concerned with fight or flight, survival and procreation, food, sex, and wanting to be the biggest, brightest peacock in the world. This is where our ego and desires come from. Everybody wants to be chief big feather with all the adornments and these desires will continue as long as the electricity is flowing through this brainstem. With the practice of Kachari Mudra, the tongue acts like a fuse and redirects the electricity of the body from the medulla oblongata to the pineal gland. You can see from this picture the results from diverting this electrical flow. The uvula conducts the electricity and burns up the frenulum which is the ligament that binds the tongue to the bottom of the mouth. You can clearly see the hard white scabs that appeared underneath my tongue from the practice of Kachari Mudra. The burning up of the frenulum allowed my tongue to go further and further up the nasal pharynx and eventually opened up my Vishuddha Chakra. The goal of yoga is to connect the consciousness or Anahata Chakra to the Ashna Chakra through the Brahma Nadi, which runs right up the center of the Shishuma. In English, this is known as the central nervous system. This connects your soul with your Christ consciousness, which will then allow you to tap into the cosmic consciousness. You don't want the electricity to flow through the medulla oblongata because that brings about body consciousness, or as Jesus put it, you serve mammon. You want the electricity to flow through the tongue right to the pituitary gland. This is a multi-stage process. The nadis must be opened, balanced, and cleared Slowly over time, the shishuma is able to carry an increasingly load of electricity. When the electricity gets strong enough, chakras open and the tongue eventually busts through the 10th gate, allowing you to drink from the Holy Grail or taste the Amrita. When the pituitary gland is stimulated with this electricity, copious amounts of this nectar is produced. When this nectar makes it into the bloodstream, samadhi takes place. This nectar anesthetizes the brainstem. A powered down brainstem would explain the near death experiences that people have had where their heart stopped and they experienced peace, love, warmth, felt the presence of the divine, etc. What happened to them is their body really did die and the electricity stopped flowing to the brainstem. When their heart started back up again, sensory perceptions returned sending electricity back to the brainstem and body consciousness returned. For a brief amount of time, they experience what yogis experience in samadhi when they divert the electricity from the lower brainstem, stimulating the pituitary and pineal gland to produce the amrita. A Wikipedia search on parts of the brain reveals the following information. The medulla oblongata is the lower half of the brainstem that connects the higher levels of the brain to the spinal cord, the upper half being the pond. The medulla contains the cardiac, respiratory, and vasomotor centers and deals with autonomic and voluntary functions such as breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The pons is part of the brainstem that leaks the medulla oblongata and the thalamus. The pons contains nuclei that relays signals from the forebrain to the cerebellum along with nuclei that deal primarily with sleep, respiration, swallowing, bladder control, hearing, equilibrium, taste, eye movement, facial expressions, 
facial sensations, and posture. The thalamus is perched on top of the brainstem, right above the pons, near the center of the brain, with nerve fibers projecting out to the cerebral cortex in all directions. The thalamus has multiple functions. It may be thought of as kind of a switchboard of information. It is generally believed to act as a relay between a variety of subcortical areas and the cerebral cortex. In particular, every sensory system includes a thalamic nucleus that receives sensory signals and sends them to the associated primal cortical area. The thymus would still be active in stage four of Kachari, just receiving electricity from the tongue instead of the senses. Notice that the brain stem is all about the senses, respiration, and circulation, the very things we are supposed to shut down to reach Nervakalpa Samadhi. When the breath shuts down, part of the mind shuts down. When the breath stops, the time-based reality stops. Thinking about the past and the future happens only when you make a concerted effort to focus on it. When you can shut off the senses, you make it to Samadhi, or the void. When you raise the kundalini through the brahmanadi, with the energy going to the sahasrara, enlightenment takes place. The key is directing where and how the electricity flows in your body. From the book Mijda, a book about the early life of Yogananda. During the practice of kriya, the prana, and therefore the mind or consciousness, which draws from the senses and pierces the cerebral spinal chakras as it's drawn upward and becomes settled at the top of the shashumna. Through the performance of Kachari Mudra, that divine life current draws the prana from the senses into the spine and directs it up through the chakras to the universal spirit, uniting the consciousness with spirit. The entire body is thereby spiritualized and energized. As a result, a perceptible glow may emanate from the body. The goal of yoga is to bypass the brainstem or transcend the mind. Basically, what Jesus was saying in Matthew 6.22 is that the electricity in the body can flow or take one of two paths, heaven or hell. When thine eye is single, other interpretations say clear or good, the electricity flows to the ashna chakra or third eye, and when the electricity flows through the brainstem, you see through your physical eyes. One path gives you body consciousness, the other gives you God consciousness. Number three, Kachari Mudra allows the Sadaka to balance the nadis, which then makes the electricity of the body go up the Shashuma or Brahma Nadi. Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, if two make peace with each other in this one house, they will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away. As I spoke about earlier, you have three main nadis where the electricity flows in your body. The central nervous system, in yoga parlance, this is known as the shashuma, the parasympathetic nervous system, or ida nadi, and the sympathetic nervous system, or pingala nadi. When you have a sensory experience, the electricity flows through two different systems in the body, both the parasympathetic nervous system, ida, and the sympathetic nervous system, pingala. The Ida Nadi is responsible for telling you what you are experiencing. The Pingala Nadi is responsible for the fight or flight response, and so it can't waste time trying to figure out what it is you are experiencing because it could possibly be life-threatening. The Pingala puts the electrical sensation through the catalog of sensations that you've already experienced, and if deemed to be threatening, immediately takes the appropriate bodily response. It is the reconciliation of these two signals that come in from the same experience that causes thought or vibration. Think about how your body reacts when it hears a, a loud noise. There are two reactions. One primes the body for action while waiting for instructions. If there is pain involved, such as touching a hot stove, the sympathetic nervous system withdraws from the source before getting instructions from the parasympathetic nervous system. As long as the Ashna Chakra is not open, you will experience the world through these two systems that bring about body consciousness. As long as the energy is predominantly traveling through the Ida or Pingala Nadi, your brain is imbalanced and you will remain in body consciousness. The breath brings prana into the body causing this imbalance. As I spoke about earlier, Swami Shivananda taught that we don't breathe for the oxygen in the air, we breathe for the prana or to get the electricity in the air into our lungs. 
the body places a positive charge to all the prana that you breathe in through your right nostril and a negative charge to all the prana that you breathe in through your left nostril. Positive prana powers up the sympathetic nervous system or the pingla nadi in yogic terms and the negative prana powers up the parasympathetic nervous system or eda nadi. This prana travels down to the muladhara chakra and then depending on which nadi is currently dominant start spinning the chakras to the right or to the left depending on which nostril is currently providing the majority of the air. When the polarity of the body switches and the nostrils alternate their dominance, the rotation of the chakra first slows down, stops, and then changes direction of its spin. In yogic terms, it is not important which direction the chakras are spinning because as long as the chakras spin, the prana is being used to experience the external world. When you balance the polarity long enough so that the muladhara chakra stops spinning, the chakra opens and the prana starts traveling up the central nervous system. This internalizes your consciousness and your spiritual journey begins. The practice of a breathing technique known as Nadi Shodhana, Analoma Viloma, or alternate nostril breathing brings about a balance of the Ida Nadi and Pingla Nadi so that the electricity starts flowing up the Shashumna. When the nadis are balanced, the nostrils open up and dilate. Many people have practiced this breathing technique in yoga classes. Using the fingers to close off the nostrils is cumbersome and distracting, whereas using the tongue internally to do this takes a lot less effort. This is achieved by sticking the tongue up the nasal pharynx and up one of the nostrils, sealing it off like a cork in a bottle. The inner ears that cover the estachian tubes are physiologically designed to help you turn your tongue sideways so it can slide up the turbinate area of your nostril to the 10th gate. Kuchari Mudra also gives you the added benefit of the next topic, which is number four, allows the sadaka to rub a nerve center, which leads to dharana or one pointedness of mind. At the top of your nasal septum is a bundle of nerves. When the tongue touches this area, you can feel the electricity flowing through the tongue. The uvula is actually a transformer and uses this electricity to burn up the rest of the frenulum, allowing your tongue to go deeper into kachari. Most people have a hard time meditating because the mind and the five senses act as telephones, constantly ringing, demanding your attention. When the tongue makes a connection with the top of the nasal septum, a buzz is felt that is almost sexual in nature. Everybody has had the tingly feeling that you feel when you are about to sneeze, but for some reason you can't quite sneeze. Suddenly you feel the sneeze coming on and a sense of relief and a buzz is felt in the upper nasal area. Kachari Mudra allows you to rub these nerves and brings about this feeling. This feeling draws the attention away from the senses and the desires of the mind and you focus on the contact that is made with the tongue. Number five. Kachari Mudra assists in turning on your kundalini or opens up the knot at the muladhara chakra. This is a big one because basically I'm telling you that you have something in your body that is dormant that you are not aware of. Throughout your life, you may have had glimpses of the electrical nature of the world and your body. For example, when my yoga instructor first showed me the small particles of electricity floating around in the air above the ocean, I immediately remembered watching them with great fascination as a small child. Another fascinating thing was dragging your feet around on a rug or a carpet and then touching your brother with your finger, shocking him. Whenever you fly in an airplane and go through clouds, look out the window. You will see little white sparks of electricity dancing everywhere. This is prana. The electrical system in our bodies is largely dormant because it is unbalanced and has blockages in it that doesn't allow the electricity to flow properly. The Bible refers to these blockages as the seven seals. The senses are designed to pick up various electricities from the world. The sensation of smell is nothing more than when one of these electricities touches your olfactory nerves. The sensation of taste is when one of these electricities touches your tongue. Vibrations touch your ears, light hits your eyes, and energy touches your skin. All your sensations are made up of energy touching your body in one form or another that is interpreted within. The turning on your kundalini nomenclature 
refers to opening up the knot at the Muladhara chakra and sending up the prana through the shashuma as opposed to it going up the ida or pingala nadis. The way this is achieved through kundalini yoga is you have to balance the nadis with nadi shohana so the prana starts traveling up the shashuma. Kachari mudra prevents the outgoing air from stimulating the nerves on the roof of your mouth to send a signal to the diaphragm to contract. The practice of Kachari Mudra stills the diaphragm. Mulabandha sends more prana up the Shashuma. Jalahandra Bandha locks the prana in. And finally, Uddiyana Bandha allows a combination of prana that causes the Kundalini to ignite. There are several forms of prana or electricities in the body. A practice known as Maha Bandha ignites the Kundalini. The word Maha means great, and the word Bandha means lock. Mahabandha means the great lock, is comprised of three bandhas, Mulabandha, Uddiyana Bandha, and Jalahandra Bandha. Mulabandha is the contraction of the perineum or pelvic floor. Uddiyana Bandha is exhaling all the air out of your breathing chambers and pulling the stomach in and up, creating a vacuum in the breathing chambers. Jalahandra Bandha is bringing the head down so the chin touches the breastbone, locking the prana in. These three bandhas, in combination with Kachari Mudra, turn on your Kundalini. Number six, Kachari Mudra allows the Sadaka to push on a nerve center, shutting off all sensory perception. There is a bundle of nerves above the nasal turbinate area where the sensory perceptions of the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth go through. When your Kachari has advanced far enough, you can push on this bone which causes a compression of these nerves and stops all nerve signals from reaching the brainstem. With no electricity going to the brainstem, the mind shuts down, freeing the consciousness. In yoga parlance, this is called samadhi. You can see that the bone that you press on extends out like a diving board, and the bones supporting it are designed to bend, allowing this compression to take place. Number seven. Kachari Mudra allows the Sadaka to drink from the Fountain of Youth or King Arthur's Holy Grail. The liquid the brain makes is contained in this cup-like bone, is also known as Iwahaska by the shamans in the rainforest, Amrita by the yogis, and DMT by Western scientists. This liquid separates the consciousness from the mind. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus saw infants being suckled. He said to his disciples, these infants being suckled are like those who enter the kingdom, referring to Kachari reaching the Amrita. When stimulated with electricity from your tongue, your pituitary gland and the pineal gland make a white and yellow liquid respectively, and when they combine, they create a chemical compound that Western scientists call DMT. This compound collects in the cella tersica, which is a cup-like bone that houses the pituitary gland and is euphemistically known as the Fountain of Youth or King Arthur's Holy Grail. This liquid literally shuts down the mind and frees the consciousness to experience its true nature or oneness with the divine. When the electricity flows right under the pituitary gland, it starts vibrating, which causes the pineal gland to start vibrating, and they both produce copious amounts of this liquid. When this liquid is absorbed by the tongue, instant samadhi takes place. This is the goal of yoga on the physical plane. When Jesus was fasting out in the desert for 40 days, he was in a deep meditation drinking this liquid. The yogis call this liquid Amrita. This liquid allows the Sadaka to live without eating or drinking anything. All illnesses disappear and youth returns. You can live in heaven, God consciousness, or hell, body consciousness. It is your choice. When the snake tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden with the apple, Eve took a bite of the apple and she gained access to the tree of knowledge, or the knowledge of the body. It was an allegory for the kundalini residing in the lower chakras, or hell. The snake is a metaphor for her spine. The apple is a metaphor for sex. When the kundalini resides in the sex or stomach chakras, just like an animal, you are only concerned with survival and procreation, sex and food. When the kundalini is raised to the higher chakras, the heart, throat, third eye, and crown chakra, your thoughts are dominated by love, intellect, and the divine. When your chakras are opened, you gain access to the tree of life, 
or knowledge of God. In Genesis 1.27, it says, God created man in his own image. This does not mean that God has two arms and two legs. This means that God also has these chakras. Adam and Eve's falling was delving into body consciousness. The choice is yours. Where do you want to place your energy? I would like to end this talk with a few questions to you. Why are the Catholic and Christian churches hiding the most important teachings of Jesus? Does anybody really believe that they didn't know where Jesus was from the age 13 to 30? Why are our government-funded schools teaching us the nonsense that we evolved from monkeys? Why are we brainwashed into believe that anyone who believes in creation is intellectually challenged? Life is not evolving. Consciousness is evolving. Anybody that understands DNA, the fact that a blueprint of how you are designed is in every one of your trillions of cells, knows that we were created. In understanding DNA, you have to be intellectually challenged to believe in evolution. Why is there a concerted effort to keep the truth about who and what we are away from us? And most importantly, are you willing to spend 15 minutes each morning and night doing some simple exercises to attain enlightenment in this incarnation? One of these incarnations, you're going to have to do it. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without your spiritual birth. In the Gospel of Thomas, Logos 2, Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over the all. As Jesus said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. There really are two parallel worlds you can live in. You can call them whatever you like, heaven or hell, the tree of life or the tree of knowledge, serving God or serving mammon, your chakras or your body, God consciousness or body consciousness. There is an internal world and an external world. You can follow whatever religion you like, but there is only one path to the Father. The reality is you are all sons and daughters of the living Father. God sheds pieces of light and creates us like a plant sheds seeds. You are a piece of God. You are God playing an elaborate game of hide and seek with yourself. And you will continue to play this game until you open up your seven chakras. This is your destiny.